Welcome to our webinar on Safeguarding Adults. This webinar is based on a course that we deliver to our paid care staff. Our aim in this webinar is to give you an overview of the issues surrounding safeguarding so that you have a better understanding of the subject. Safeguarding can be a difficult and emotive subject at times and we hope that this brief webinar helps you understand some of the key issues and definitions. The aim of the webinar is to ensure care and support workers can identify abuse and respond appropriately to situations where abuse may occur and work in a person-centred way that promotes rights, inclusion and well-being. Today's aim is to ensure that you have an understanding as informal carers of these issues. We always like to have some learning outcomes. Today these are to identify legislation and guidance relevant to safeguarding, to list types of abuse, to identify signs, symptoms and risk factors of abuse. We'll not be looking at the fourth outcome today, which is to explain employer and employee responsibilities. There is a huge amount of legislation in place to support safeguarding. We've listed the legislation here, but don't worry about having to remember this. You just have to know that safeguarding is taken very seriously. We are going to look at some of legislation in a bit more detail though. The first piece we will look at is the Care Act of 2014. The Care Act of 2014 sets out a clear legal framework for how local authorities and other parts of the system should protect adults at risk of harm. The Care Act outlines the safeguarding duties of local authorities. They are lead a multi-agency local adult safeguarding system that seeks to prevent abuse and neglect and stops it quickly when it happens. Make inquiries or request others to make them when they think an adult with care and support needs may be at risk of abuse or neglect and they need to find out what action may be needed. Establish safeguarding adult boards, including the local authority, NHS and police, which will develop, share and implement a joint safeguarding strategy. Carry out safeguarding reviews when someone with care and support needs dies as a result of neglect or abuse and there is concern that the local authority or its partners could have done more to protect them. And finally, arrange for an independent advocate to represent and support a person who is the subject of a safeguarding inquiry or review, if required. The Care Quality Commission also has a number of fundamental standards. These are important to remember if you use an agency or get other support to help you with your caring. Standard 10 states that all service users must be treated with dignity and respect. Fundamental Standard 13 exists to safeguard service users from abuse and improper treatment. This includes ensuring that service users are not discriminated against or deprived of their liberty without lawful authority. We do have a webinar that is available on our YouTube channel on deprivation of liberty and we would suggest watching that webinar if that is of interest to you. There is also a plethora of other legislation to ensure that people working in care are fit and proper individuals. This includes the Disclosure and Barring Service, which you may have heard of. But that's probably enough about the legislation. Let's have a look at the principles of safeguarding. Safeguarding now encompasses six key concepts. Protection, support and representation for those in greatest need. Partnership, local solutions through services working with their communities. Communities have a massive part to play in preventing, detecting and reporting neglect and abuse. Empowerment, people being supported and encouraged to make their own decisions and inform consent. Prevention, it's better to take action before harm occurs. Proportionality, the least intrusive response appropriate to the risk presented. And finally, accountability. Accountability and transparency in safeguarding practice. So let's have a look at abuse. Here is a simple definition of abuse. Abuse is a violation of an individual's human and civil rights by any other person or persons. Abuse may consist of single or repeated acts. It may be physical, verbal or psychological. It may be an act of neglect or an omission to act. It may occur when an adult at risk of harm is persuaded to enter into a financial or sexual transaction in which he or she has not consented or does not have the capacity to consent. 
Defining abuse is complex and can be subject to wide interpretation. Many instances of abuse will constitute criminal offences involving intent, recklessness, dishonesty or negligence by the perpetrator. But abuse may also be perpetrated as a result of ignorance or poor or unsatisfactory professional practice. The abuse of adults at risk of harm can vary enormously from the theft of a relatively small amount of money from an elderly person to the systematic abuse and death of those in institutional or residential settings. It is widely acknowledged that the abuse of adults at risk of harm is under-researched and under-reported. A number of studies indicate that adults at risk of harm experience a higher prevalence of abuse and neglect than the general population and are less able to easily access services that would enable them to lead safer lives. But what about the definition of harm? Harm can be defined as ill treatment or the impairment of health or, for those conditions relating to mental health, impairment in development. And the definition of an adult at risk of harm? An adult at risk of harm is defined as someone who has needs for care and support and is experiencing or at risk of abuse or neglect and is unable to protect themselves. We've looked briefly at definitions of harm and who is an adult at risk of harm. So now we are going to look at abuse and some examples of what abuse may be. We will look at some of these in a bit more detail as we progress through this webinar. Examples of abuse could include psychological abuse, discrimination, financial abuse and of course neglect. Let's have a look at neglect or acts of omission. This can be defined as the repeated deprivation or failure to provide assistance that the person needs for important activities of daily living or a failure of an adult to take care of themselves. This could mean not providing for basic needs such as warmth, food, decent clothes, little or no assistance with going to the toilet, bathing, incontinence, dressings or mobility, a failure to request medical attention or provide prescribed medication, or degrading treatment. What about psychological abuse? This abuse impinges on the emotional health and development of the individual. So, for example, bullying or online abuse, a lack of stimulation or activities, no provision for cultural or religious needs, limited or no opportunity to make decisions about their own life, degrading treatment or a limit on their freedom. Let's look at discriminatory abuse or abuse that is directed at someone because of their race, their sexuality, their culture, their gender or some other defining characteristic. This could include, for instance, being offered a substandard service repeated exclusion from basic rights such as health care, unequal treatment or derogatory remarks. What about self-neglect? This can be more of a challenge as it can be difficult to determine when neglect is a lifestyle choice or is unavoidable and leading to harm. But it is important to remember that it can be brought about by a variety of causes and is often a situation not chosen by the individual. Self-neglect can include living in dirty conditions, suffering from non-treatment of illness, malnutrition or dehydration. Now for organisational abuse. This may apply to residential and nursing homes, hospitals, day centres, sheltered housing schemes, groups or supported housing projects. It should be noted that all organisations and services, whatever their setting, can have institutional practices which can cause harm to adults at risk of harm. It may be reflected in an enforced schedule of activities, the limiting of personal freedom, the control of personal finances, lack of adequate clothing, poor personal hygiene, a lack of stimulating activities or a low quality diet. In fact, anything which treats service users as not being entitled to a normal life. The distinction between abuse in organisations and poor care standards is not easily made and judgments about whether an event or situation is abusive should be made with advice from appropriate professionals and regulatory bodies. Physical abuse can be defined as the non-accidental infliction of physical force that results in bodily injury, pain or impairment. This could include, for instance, 
poor or illegal moving and handling, lifting by one person when two should be used, using the wrong hoist or using untrained operators, hitting, pushing, slapping, the covert administration of medication, or the unauthorised restraint or inappropriate restraint. What about domestic abuse? This is any type of controlling, bullying, threatening or violent behaviour between people in a relationship and includes emotional, physical, sexual, financial, psychological, so-called honour-based violence, female genital mutilation and forced marriage. Sexual abuse is the direct or indirect involvement in sexual activity without consent. For example, this can be inappropriate touching, sexual advances, intercourse without consent. People with dementia or learning disabilities may have a different level of comprehension, being shown pornography. This can also be between staff and service users or to service users. And finally, for the purpose of this webinar, financial abuse. This is the unauthorised, fraudulent obtaining and proper use of funds, property or any resources belonging to a person who is at risk of harm. This can include the theft of money or possessions, the misuse of personal allowances, poor or no recording of those, not returning correct change from shopping or inappropriate use of vouchers or store cards, and even the receiving of gifts. In the next couple of slides, we're going to look at some of the things that may be seen as indicators of abuse. Of course, some of these may well be signs of other issues that you might need to check on. To start, being withdrawn or quiet, an unwillingness to speak or communicate, a loss of appetite or weight, sleep disturbances or a change of sleep pattern, displays of emotions such as tears or anger, unexplained bruising, a lack of interest in appearance and surroundings, and the care worker or support worker always wishing to be present at interviews, unexplained reactions towards particular individuals or areas, a dislike of being touched, self-harm, frequent or regular visits to the GP or casualty department, inconsistency of explanation regarding areas of possible concern, disturbed sleeping patterns, obsessive or behaviour that challenges, panic attacks or withdrawal of verbal communication. When it comes to safeguarding adults, it is really important to think about who might be in an abuser. The short answer is anyone, relatives and family members, paid staff, volunteers, other service users, neighbours, friends, associates. It's also important to identify some of the reasons that abuse may occur. For employees and people working in paid positions, there could be a number of reasons. These could include poor recruitment processes, inadequate training, staffing shortages, support staff working in isolation, individuals who are having stressful or difficulties outside of work. There are many others listed here. Of course, none of these reasons are an excuse. Finally, we want to have a look at those adults who may be at risk of harm. They may be individuals who have limited or no mental capacity. They may be verbally or physically aggressive towards staff. They might disturb staff at night. They might present inappropriate sexual behaviour towards support staff. And they might have communication difficulties. Thank you for attending this brief webinar on safeguarding adults. This is a really complex and emotive subject and we've only covered some of the basics here. For those of you who are interested, we can arrange further safeguarding training. You can contact us via our website at www.barnetcarers.org.